The Wallace Center, a business unit of Winrock International, is the host of the MGFN webinar series. The Wallace Center has been a leading organization in the movement for a more sustainable and equitable food system for over 25 years. Today, the center supports entrepreneurs and communities as they build a new 21st century food system that is healthier for people, the environment, and the economy. The center serves the growing community of civic, business, and philanthropic organizations involved in building a new good food system in the United States. In particular, we're focused on achieving, uh, advancing regional collaborative efforts around the country to move good food, healthy, green, fair, affordable food beyond the direct marketing realm into larger a larger scale wholesale channels. The National Good Food Network, or NGFN, is an initiative of the Wallace Center. It is structured as a network of networks, ensuring efficient flow of information uh, and innovation from boots on the ground projects to the national level and back down to the grassroots level, level across the nation. The Wallace Center coordinates and supports the network. Our goals are to work with the growers to ensure that there's an abundant supply of good food to meet the high consumer demand for the product, to collect and disseminate the best models, stories, methods, and outcomes, and to ensure that policymakers are informed about the wonderful successes our networks and partners have had so that we can continue to increase support, uh, increase support for regional healthy food. Uh, highly appropriate, this goal uh, for this particular webinar. You can learn more about the great work uh, we've been doing at ngfn.org. One major piece of the NGFN's work is the NGFN Food Hub Collaboration. For the last couple of years, we have worked to support the growth and success of food hubs across the country with a four-pillar approach, networking, research, technical assistance, and intensive work with nine study hubs and some regional food hub networks. We have a library of fantastic resources uh, for food hubs. You can get there directly uh, by typing foodhub.info into your web browser. I'll tell you this at the end, too. Uh, this is a collaboration with USDA Agricultural Marketing Service, Center for Regional Food Systems uh, over at MSU, uh, Farm Credit Council, and recent collaboration partners Wholesome Wave, School Food Focus, and the National Farm to School Network, all bringing unique perspectives to supporting this linchpin piece of regional food systems. Okay, so uh, Let's get into the meat of this. Let me introduce Sarah Hackney. Sarah is the Grassroots Director at the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. She develops and coordinates NSAC's National Gra Grassroots Advisory Campaigns on Federal Food and Farm Policy in collaboration with NSAC staff, staff and member organizations. Her past work focused on improving small farm viability, increasing fresh food access, and building leadership in rural communities. She holds a BA in Environmental Studies from Dartmouth College. Sarah? Hey there, Jeff. Can you hear me all right? Oh, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, thanks so much to the folks at the Wallace Center and for letting me get on, get on the telephone and the computer today to have a conversation with you guys. And thanks to everybody who's registered for, uh, for getting ready to sit in and participate in what is a really, really, really critical topic and uh, not, not necessarily the most uh, light and gentle bedtime reading or conversation. So I'm really happy to be here and really happy to have a conversation with you all. So with that, let me make sure my computer is working and we will get started. Perfect. All right, we're on. So. Howdy again, my name is Sarah. Uh, what am I here to talk about with you today? We're just gonna work through, so we've got about an hour and a half today to get through a pretty big topic, a pretty critical topic for folks, uh, for food hubs and for farmers who work with them. We're gonna get into a little bit about uh, what's going on with food safety, why does it involve food hubs, why should I get involved? We'll get into some of the nitty gritty uh, details on the Food Safety Modernization Act, both an overview of what the rules do and some of the key issues that the sustainable agriculture community has with the rules. And then after that, after we take some questions on the nuts and bolts of the rules, we'll also talk about how and why you should take action today. We'll walk you through some resources we have and sort of go through the process of what it's like to submit a comment to FDA.
But first, just to give you a little heads up, just so you know who the heck is talking to you today. Again, my name is Sarah. I work with the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition in Washington, D.C. We're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year, and we're an alliance of grassroots organizations from all across the country who work to, to basically to, to build a better food, better food and farm future by improving federal food and farm policy. We work on a huge range of issues from, uh, from organic ag to beginning farmer work to local and regional food systems work to, as we're going to talk about today, food safety. The Wallace Center is an awesome member of our coalition. I'll take a minute here to note, too, that I'm just one person of a, of a staff of several here in DC, and my colleague Ariane Lati, our assistant policy director, is the one who's doing much of the heavy lifting on our food safety work. So I will take and answer as many questions as I possibly can today. Please ask all that you have. If in any, if any instance I am like, you know, this is a nitty-gritty question, I may need to go back and double-check the sources or talk to my coworkers, I'll tell you that clearly and we can follow up over email. So just a heads up that if I can't answer it, someone on our team will definitely do their best to be able to do so. And just to kind of uh, give us a little bit of a 30,000 foot view to get started, why does Insect work on food safety and, and what's our approach in the first place? Well, we work on it because it matters, because it's an integral piece of developing, you know, even as our local and regional food system develops as a broader piece of our nation's ag system, it's absolutely critical that we take a look at and we integrate food safety into our work. And what that means to us when we work on food safety is first that it matters, and then from there, that everyone has a role, from the farmer who's growing the food to the consumer who's buying it and taking it home and putting it on their family's tables. All of us have a piece, to, a piece and a part to play in the system. From there, food safety needs to focus on highest risk activities. That means that anything coming down in terms of federal regulations needs to reflect the different activities and operations represent different levels of risk for foodborne illness. Also, one size does not fit all. Rules need to reflect that reflect a scale-appropriate approach for different sizes and kinds of food and farm operations. And finally, that the rules need to be based on scientific evidence whenever possible, that we're backing things up with the best research that we have on hand. So that's kind of the big picture of where we're coming from. But that is probably a little less interesting to you than the nitty-gritty details of what's going on, so let me get started. First. Why should I care? Why should I get involved? A lot of people say, well, yeah, of course food safety is important. Why, you know, what's the big deal? Why is, there, why is there an issue? Why are we talking about this? And the reason is because our coalition, which includes the, the member organizations across the country and the farmers and the eaters who we in those organizations represent, we're concerned that sustainable agriculture could become collateral damage in the effort to improve food safety if we don't get some key changes made to these draft rules, we're particularly concerned that they are going to have a huge impact on farmers, especially organic and sustainable growers, and for innovative efforts like food hubs that are seeking to foster more local and regional connections between growers and eaters. We're concerned they're going to make it harder for beginning farmers to get started to succeed and for existing farmers to be able to diversify and grow their operations. And we're concerned that in the long run, it's going to reduce choices for consumers at local mar markets and make local and regional food harder to find. Uh, and I'll just emphasize here, we definitely don't say these things lightly. Uh, we at Intech and our members, uh, we're definitely not interested in scare tactics at all. Our coalition has been at work since January on analysis of these proposed rules and has been reaching out and working weekly, daily with farmers, organizations, and tapping extensive expertise in trying to understand just what these rules say and why it matters. So just a couple of basics to get you started. As you probably know, the Food Safety Modernization Act represents really the first major overhaul to our nation's food safety laws since the 1930s. It started getting debated in Congress a couple years back and starting in 09, was signed into law in 2011. And effectively what it is, it's a legislative mandate to apply comprehensive prevention-based controls across the food supply aimed at reducing foodborne illness in our country. There's four main pieces that you see on the screen. The two that we're going to focus on today are the two big ones that are most relevant for you on the phone. 
and that's the Standards for Produce Safety, also known as the Produce Rule, and Preventive Controls for Facilities, also known as the Preventive Controls Rule. And those are the two that I'm going to get into in more detail. So what exactly did I do? Actually, before we go there, let me just remind you, um, for a little bit of background context, I mean, you know how I just mentioned, this was debated in Congress a couple years back. When, this, when these rules were first coming through the halls of Congress, the sustainable ag community won a number of really critical amendments during that legislative fight to make sure that these rules would work for sustainable agriculture. So just a couple, I'm not going to read all of these, but you'll see them on your screen. That includes provisions guaranteeing that the rules need to be scale appropriate. That includes provisions guaranteeing that the rules need to not, uh, need to not prohibit or otherwise cause problems for on-farm conservation and wildlife habitat preservation. That the rules needed to complement, not to contradict, other regulations like from those in the National Organic Program. So just to note, these are many things that had we not engaged in the legislative fight a few years ago, we may not have won at the time. The core of our work now is, now that the law, now that FISMA has been signed into law, now that FDA has it in rulemaking, we want to make sure that FDA followed these congressional directives, and if not, to ask them to do so. We're having a little bit of slide lag, but there we go, catching up. So where are we now? Like I said, signed into the law in 2011. Uh, that shifts everything, as you know, your, your little legislative primer. Once Congress signs, signs a law, or once Congress passes a bill, goes to the president, he signs it into law. It then goes to the appropriate agency for rulemaking. FDA has been at work in rulemaking for, they were at it for two years. And in January 4th of this year, they released the draft proposed regulations. Ever since then, we've been buried in analysis and trying to understand just what's up with the rules. The comment period has been extended twice. This is a case where sustainable ag advocates, larger industry advocates, uh, just about everybody who has a stake in these rules said, you know what, we need a little more time. They're complicated. They're thousands of pages long. We need a little more time to weigh in with the comment period. They've extended it twice. They are very unlikely to do so again. And the deadline for public comments is coming up really soon on November 15th. And just a note here, and we'll talk more about this in a little bit, but the general gist of it is once FDA releases these proposed, uh, you know, a set of, of draft guidelines, they're legally bound to seek public comment. That's what's happening right now. We'll talk a little bit more about making comments later, but this is a critical time. The rules are in draft form. It's a really key opportunity for us to weigh in. All right, now let's get into some rule nitty-gritty. First up, and so what I'll do here is I'll, I'll give a couple, I'll give a little bit of basic info about each rule. I'll talk a little bit about the different levels or the different tiers of regulation within each rule, and then I'll get into the issues with each rule, and then we'll take time for questions. So first, just getting into the basics. What's the deal? Okay, first, proposed produce rule. The produce rule effectively sets up new federal regulations that set standards for the growing, harvesting, packing, and holding of fresh fruits and vegetables for human consumption. Farms that find themselves subject to the produce rule will need to follow FDA guidelines with regards to the things that you see on your screen, with regards to how they handle agricultural water on their farm, how they handle biological soil amendments of animal origin, AKA compost and manure uh, on their farm, how they handle things like equipment and basic sanitation practices. The produce rule sets guidelines for how farms need to manage those things on their farm. This is the part of FISMA that may impact, if you're a farmer, this is the part that really cuts into the, nut, the nuts and bolts of how you run your operation. If you're a food hub, this is the part of the rule that may most impact the growers that you work with. Many could find themselves partially or fully subject to the produce rule. I'll note as well for folks uh, who are sort of familiar with the larger food safety world, the produce rule at this time uh, doesn't really, it doesn't preclude or prevent or in any way really interact with whether or not a farmer has good agricultural practice gap certification or other food safety measures in place on their farm. 
So that's a little bit, that's the, the, the extreme basics on the produce rule. Let's talk a little bit for a second about the preventive controls rule. There we go. So the basics, the preventive controls rule, and this is the one that if you are a food hub is the one that's most likely to directly impact and affect your, your business. Preventive controls rule sets standards for facilities that manufacture and process food for human consumption. Because of the way that FDA defines such terms as manufacturing, processing, packing, and holding, food hubs are almost guaranteed to be considered facilities under this rule and subject to, in some fashion, the requirements of the preventive controls rule. There are two major parts to the rule uh, that we'll get into here for a few minutes. The first is what's called the hazard analysis and risk-based preventive controls. If anybody on the call is at all familiar with how uh, meat, how, say, meat is, grown, is processed and regulated in the U.S., if you're familiar with uh, what's called a HACCP plan that, say, a processing facility for meat would be subject to having and maintaining, HARP-C, as we call it, is is similar in terms of its approach. Effectively, it's a food safety plan. It's a food safety plan that an individual would have to either be trained to develop, or you know you could hire on someone to develop it. So kind of it's um, and it would cover kind of the basics of exactly what it says. So hazard analysis to identify and evaluate hazards for each type of food that comes through your facility. I would have to identify what they call preventive controls, which are basically the measures that you take to minimize or prevent those hazards, monitoring procedures, corrective actions, and verifications. So effectively, it's a pretty substantial food safety plan for your facility. The rule also includes some updates to current already on the books good manufacturing practice requirements that some of you may already be subject to. Another important thing to note, if there are any farmers on the call or folks who do both growing of produce and processing or packing or aggregating of produce. There's a new kind of definition they call the farm mix type facility. That's an operation that does both and that might, in fact, be subject to both rules. Again, the produce rule really aiming to cover the production, the growing of food. The preventive controls rule really intended to cover everything else. So let's talk a little bit about who may or may not be affected by each of the rules, because this is where, for a lot of people, things get a little confusing and where people really want and have been asking us for a lot of guidance. So effectively, and I'll, I'll, I'll note again, I'll try to make it as straightforward and simple as I can. Please do not hesitate to ask questions. There are no dumb questions here. This stuff is pretty muddy. In essence, there are really three primary tiers of regulation under which a farm may find, a farm or facility may find themselves under FSMA. There's, full, there's exemption, which is not subject to, which is effectively not subject to regulation. There's modified requirements, and there's fully subject to a rule. So the modified requirements are, you know, effectively means you're not exempt, but you may be subject to lesser or slightly different regs than the full-on rule. So next what I'll do is I'll kind of walk you through each of those three categories for each rule. Let's start with the produce rule. And again, I know that if you're a food hub, this may not directly impact you, but for any farmers you work with, it's important to have a sense of how this may go down. Exempt from the produce rule is produce rarely consumed raw. There's a list of covered produce, and there's product, there are produce items that are not covered by the produce rule. That includes, just as an example, like say white baking potatoes. People tend not to eat those raw. They tend to go on for further processing or cooking, AKA they have a kill step. They are not covered by the produce rule. Produce for personal or on-farm consumption. Home gardeners, you are safe. Not a problem here. Not subject to the rules. Finally, if you're a very small farm, if the average annual value of the food you've sold in the last three years is under 25000 bucks, you are exempt from the produce rule no matter what you grow. Modified requirements. This is, again, that sort of middle step between exempt and fully subject. If you're growing produce, it's going immediately on to further commercial processing. This would be an example if you're contracted in to grow, say, um, sauce tomatoes that immediately go on to be made into sauce. They have a kill step. They're not subject to the produce rule guidelines. Secondly, 
if you qualify under what was what's known as the Tester Hagen Amendment. This is, as you'll recall, I talked about we won some really critical legislative victories a couple years back. Tester Hagen is the big one. And let's get this slide to load up. So what does it mean if I am if I how do I know if I fall under Tester Hagen in the produce standards? Then, okay, here we go. Here's where it starts to get a little tricky. So you're subject to the modified requirements, not the full requirements of the produce rule, or you're eligible to be if the average annual value in the last three years of your product, of all the products sold on your farm, is under $500,000, and you sell more than half of what you grow directly to a consumer or a retail food establishment in your state or within 275 miles, then you could be eligible for modified requirements under Tester Hagen. That means that you're not subject to the full requirements of the produce rule, but you do have to, um, you have, there's some really, there's some basic pieces of the rule that you'd be subject to, including, just simply including your name and a complete business address on either a food packaging label, a sign displayed at the point of sale, or documents that would be delivered with your produce in the normal, cor uh, the normal course of business. So that's sort of the, the tier. And again, if you're subject to the full rule, going back to that list I just talked about a minute ago, you would be subject to those FDA guidelines for those kinds of practices around ag water, compost, hygiene on your farm. All right, let's talk a little bit about preventive controls rule and who's affected. This one is where things get particularly sticky, but it's really critical for any food hubs on the phone uh, to pay attention here and to understand where you fall in this regime. So first and foremost, if FDA considers you a facility, a facility, if you do something in the normal means of packing, holding, processing, manufacturing food for people, and FDA considers you a facility, no matter your scale, you must register with FDA as a facility. And as such, you would be subject to inspection. That's even if you're exempt, you're otherwise exempt, or only partially subject to other pieces of the rule if you are a facility, you must register. And this is actually not totally new um, under FISMA. This actually goes back to 2002 to the what's known as the Bioterrorism Act, the Public Health Security and Bioterrorism Preparedness and Response Act of 2002, which is a real mouthful. In that act, this is you know this as you recall, this comes this came around post post two, um, post 9/11, sort of in a you know folks really concerned about the possibility of bioterrorism in the U.S., Congress recently required any facility engaged in manufacturing, processing, packing, or holding food for consumption in the U.S. to register with FDA. So this is not necessarily a new thing, but in the way that FDA has taken a look at those definitions, some operations that may not have had to register in the past may now have to register. Food hubs, you may be in that category. Some other, some other issues to help you understand what we mean by facility. Again, it can sometimes include activities done on a farm. If you are doing something that FDA considers not part of simple farm operations, but actually processing food, you may also be, you may be both a farm and a facility in FDA advice. They draw a lot of distinctions between things you do to your own products and things you do to others. This is where, let's say, you know, if you're a farmer and you're, you're, uh, you're trimming the outer leaves off of, lettuce, of your own lettuce, that is considered kind of part of your daily doing business. If you're doing similar actions to other people's produce on your farm, you may be a facility. As you might expect, this is a little out of sync with what we see as the reality of farming, which is what we see as you know a lot of really innovative, cooperative efforts across different farms on different sites, working together to aggregate and to sort of achieve some economies of scale, to coll co collaborate on processes where it makes sense to do so. Um, there's some concern that the way they've defined facility could put some of those activities under increased and excessive scrutiny. We'll get more into the issues in a minute, but that's just something to flag for you right now. Let's talk a little bit more about exemptions and modified requirements because it's just so fun. Um, first, first off, first and foremost, you remember I talked a few minutes ago about those Part C requirements, the food safety plan. Some facilities are exempt from those requirements. There's a small, it's a small list, but here it is. You see it on your screen. Certain on-farm low-risk processing activities, including making jam or maple syrup, 
if done by what FDA considers a small or very small business, we'll talk more about that definition in a few minutes, you may be still required to register, still subject to inspection, but exempt from the more expensive and onerous food safety planning requirements. If you do seafood, juice, low acid canned food, dietary supplements, alcoholic beverages, those are regulated in other fashion, so they're not subject to HARPC. Again, like I mentioned earlier, if all that you do falls squarely into FDA's definition of farm, not facility, you're okay. And finally, certain facilities that only store packaged food or raw ag commodities that are not fruit and vegetables that are going immediately to further processing, you may not be subject to the HARPC requirements. Modified requirements. Here's where, if you're sort of a you know, relatively small food hub, you could fall under this category. So let's say you are a facility. You do something, you do undertake some activities that make you a facility in FDA's eyes, but you do not meet those exemption criteria. You might be eligible for modified requirements. What that means if, so you are eligible if, <laughs> you fit FDA's definition of a very small business, which we'll talk about in a little bit, in a little while. Um, but right now, that's, that's at this point, a sales cap. Or the average value, again, here's Sister Hagen again, the average annual value in the last three years of your products is under 500,000 bucks, and you sell more than half of what, you, of what you sell directly to a consumer or a retail food establishment in the same state or within a 275-mile radius. Then you may qualify for modified requirements underneath Tester Hagen. What do those modified requirements ask of you if you're eligible? They require a couple of things, and um, I'm going to get into, and I, you know, I should have noted this earlier, but everything that I'm talking about today, we have much more info online. I'll share some links with you soon that walk you through it, but just a heads up, just to emphasize, I'm kind of moving quickly. If you're sort of hustling through this and thinking, wow, I need to get into this in more detail, we'll talk in a little bit about some online resources where you can walk through at your own pace and, and take a deeper look at the regs. But back to it. If you may, if you think you, if you fall under those Tester Hagen thresholds and you're eligible for modified requirements, that means you'd be required to submit documentation of this status to FDA and to either Submit documentation of your compliance with other non-federal food safety law and notify customers as such. Or submit documentation that, that shows that you've identified potential hazards and are monitoring preventive controls measures to reduce the risk of foodborne uh, contamin of contamination on your facility. We kind of call that um, sort of like harp sea light or it's sort of like a, a food safety plan light. So as you can see, it would be, you know, it's you're still subject to the rules, but you'd be subject to sort of a, a slightly lower tier, or lesser level of regulation. So there's the basics. That's just sort of the, the, the very, very skimming off the top of what basically do the rules require and who may or may not be affected. What I'm going to get into now for a few minutes are some of the key problems with the rules that the sustainable agriculture community has been working on and will be advocating for FDA to fix before these rules become final law. I'm going to start with the produce rule, and then I'll move to preventive controls. I'm going to, again, move quickly. All this is also online, and we're happy to talk and answer questions as well. But I'll try to move quickly so we can stay on track and have time for questions. All right, let's get started. Produce rule. There's issues around the way the produce rule sets guidelines for manure and compost. Namely, if you're a grower, <laughs> you know this is a problem. The, the rules set a nine-month interval between when you can apply manure and harvest produce from harvest, harvest crops from that field. This is a huge concern. One, this makes it very, very difficult to use manure in certain kinds of compost made with animal materials. It directly conflicts with national organic program regulations and their own waiting periods on the use of these fertilizers. It's inconsistent with conservation practice standards. And in our opinion, it's also based on very limited scientific evidence. So we're really encouraging growers to weigh in with FDA on why the way that they're setting rules around the use of manure and compost is a problem for farmers, both organic and conventional. On-farm natural resource conservation, 
uh, there's a lot of nice language in the FIS in the FISMA preamble where they recognize the importance of on-farm conservation of wildlife habitat and the role that farm the critical role that farms play. It's kind of an interface between wildlands and you know and working lands, and that it, there is a role for conservation and for wildlife habitat on a farm. Unfortunately, when it actually gets the nuts and bolts of the rules, they don't explicitly protect or promote conservation practices. Um, they don't incorporate what we call co-management considerations for the joint management of a farm and its natural resources. There's some lack of clarity and there's some issues around when and how grazing animals can be allowed into fields. And they only belatedly started their environmental in impact statement process. The concern here is that while the rules don't forbid, say, having wildlife buffers or having honeybee habitat or, or wild pollinator habitat on your farm, and then there's nothing protecting that practice from an inspector coming in and saying, this could be a source of a problem, and I think you should tear it out. So there's some concerns there. Water and water testing. This is a huge one that growers are really, really up in arms about. If So this, again, the produce rule governs sort of how uh, growers can and should manage the ag water that they use on their farm. If you use surface water, if you use water from a stream, a lake, any kind of surface water, they require weekly water testing for generic E. coli. And they need that water to meet an EPA recreational water standard. That's a really high standard. And they're, and they're testing, again, for generic E. coli, which is naturally found in the environment, not for pathogenic. This is definitely, again, this is a pretty big expense. This is a lot more stringent standard than any growers are really currently subject to. And it and then and I guess another piece that I should flag for you right now is FDA requires that if you test your water every week, if you find if there if the water doesn't pass that test, you have to immediately stop using the water, take steps to fix the problem or to chemically treat it. Um, and right now there are not any EPA approved chemicals for the wholesale treatment of ag water. So as you can see, we've got a lot of problems in the way that FDA is approaching water on a farm. Sarah, can I just yep. pop in for just a second? Sure. Um, uh, many, I think many of the people on the call will not be, uh, their businesses won't be directly affected by several of these rules, but uh -huh. their suppliers will be, right? And, yep, um, very much so, so. Right, and so one of, one of our uh, hopes is that um, you as a um, members of the value chain will take some of this information back to your suppliers, your growers, and say, you know, you have to comment too. Um, and Sarah's going to tell you all about uh, exactly where, where you'd point them uh, as well as yourselves to, to the, get these resources. So we're, we're being exhaustive here because uh, you, you all run businesses, but you're also dependent upon um, so you, you run businesses affected by uh, FISMA, but you're also dependent on uh, businesses also affected by FISMA, possibly in different ways. So just, just some context, sorry. No, that's, that's fantastic, Jeff. Thanks for, thanks for that. And yeah, let me just underscore all that. Trying to get you, yeah, I'm trying to be exhaustive in the name of helping you understand what's going on with the rules, but absolutely. Uh, if you aren't directly affected by pieces of, say, the produce rule, we will walk you through and talk about how you can help make sure that your suppliers and people you work with are aware and have a chance to weigh in. So there's uh, one more rule, one more issue in the produce rule, and then I'm going to talk about some issues with that preventive controls rule. Um, but first, the last one, and this is actually, I do want to highlight one really good thing in the proposed produce rule that we're very much hoping and asking that FDA keeps. They had, FDA had a choice when they started writing these rules between um, what they call an integrated or a commodity-specific approach. That means they could have chosen either to draft guidelines based on an integrated whole farm approach, or they could have drafted different, different guidelines for each different kind of covered produce. As you can imagine, for diversified growers who may grow 10, 20, 50 different kinds of fruits and vegetables, we really have been advocating for this integrated approach so that one grower who may grow 15 kinds of covered produce doesn't need to meet 15 separate standards for different products. This is an important decision. FDA has tentatively said we're going to go with this integrated approach. We want to say, yes, that was the right move. Uh, we encourage you to keep that 
in the final rules. So just another one there. All right, let's talk a little bit about some preventive controls issues because these, if you're a food hub operator, these are going to be very, very relevant. Um, the first one, and this is this is really more for anybody, if anybody on the line happens to run a CSA, have a roadside stand, be involved with a farmer's market. Uh, I talked earlier about, um, I may have mentioned briefly, retail food establishments a little while ago. Uh, the gist of this here is when Congress wrote FISMA, they made a very important clarification, and they, which is basically that they said uh, retail food establishments are exempt from being considered facilities by FDA. So that means if you're, say, a grocery store, FDA does not consider you a facility. You're not subject to the preventive controls rule. Likewise, Congress said direct-to-consumer outlets, such as CSAs and roadside stands, should be considered retail food establishments and not facilities. Unfortunately, despite the fact that Congress directed them to make that clear in the rules, FDA uh, neglected to do so. We believe this was an oversight and not an intentional, um, an intentional move, but it is very important that FDA follow through on that congressional intent and mandate with regards to direct-to-consumer things. What that means, and let me just give you an example to help you contextualize it uh, for any maybe CSA folks on the phone or folks who know CSA operators. This means if a farmer opts to include some of her neighbor's peaches in her weekly CSA box even a few times during the growing season, without this really critical clarification, her farm would be considered a facility, which potentially could subject her to substantial and costly regulation. Whereas if the CSA is considered that retail food establishment, that is not the case. So this is an important piece that we are really pushing with FDA. Let's talk for a minute about, um, I think, what may be the most important issue with regards to changes to the rules that impact, that could potentially impact food hubs. I talked a little while ago about when it comes to those modified requirements, FDA says, you know, you can meet that tester Hagen test or you could be considered a very small business. FDA has not decided where the threshold should fall for a very small business. They're deciding between $250,000, $500,000, or a million dollars in gross sales of all food. We are advocating for the highest figure, the million dollar figure, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, most significantly for folks like you on the call is that Food hubs need, you know, a million dollars in wholesale, in wholesale sales is not is not really a lot. And with really thin margins in that business, it's really important that startup operations with, with low sales be able to grow and sustain themselves before they're subject to full-scale regulation. So this is really critical. We are advocating strongly for that million dollar threshold in the final rules. A couple other issue points, and then let's talk about, uh, then we'll take questions. So again, I alluded to this earlier. There's a lot of problems in the rules with how they've defined things like farm and facility. There's a lot of, there's a lot of confusion. They sort of assumed, FDA assumed that farms simply grow the food, and they don't really prepare or sell it or aggregate it in any fashion. Not necessarily true. Um, as, soon as, as soon as you're packing or holding anybody else's ag products, you may be a facility. Um, this is a big deal, and... I don't know, you know, for folks on the call, if any of you are farmers who also do a little aggregating, let's say you help take your neighbors, you know, if, if you and your neighbor collaborate on some weekly restaurant deliveries, that's the sort of thing where you would need to look really closely at the rules to ensure that, to find out and ensure that you may not be considered, that you may or may not, you would need to look closely at the rules. You might be considered a facility and subject to additional regulation under these proposed rules. Oh, do we, is my, so the screen just turned black, Jeff, and I'm not sure if that's just on my end. Yeah, that's, that's what I have, too. That's a curious one. <laughs> I did not mean to imply that the apocalypse comes next. Um, or that <laughs> oh, there we go. All right, beautiful. That's what I'm looking for. Or <laughs> Actually, it looks like we went one too far, and I don't know if I can, can I go back? Let's find out. Or if someone could go back one slide for me, that would be up. Oh, perfect. That's the one I needed. Great. Thanks so much. Here's another issue in both rules. Um, you know how I talked about earlier, 
Congress said, these rules need to be scale appropriate. They need to reflect different size operations in the food system. Uh, that hasn't been fully done. And one really key way that that may pose a problem that I want to talk a little bit about that some of you may have heard about is even if, as a food hub or as a farm or as a, any kind of food or farm business, even if you may think at this point that you qualify for either full exemption or modified requirements under the rules as proposed, FDA has also been granted very broad new powers in terms of their ability to withdraw those, uh, those exemptions and modified requirements without a strong evidentiary standard for doing so and without clear due process for how you might get your protected or your, your exemption or modified requirement status back. This is a big concern. Um, we obviously want FDA to be able to tackle food safety outbreaks and crises. However, farmers also need due process. They need, especially in the case of false alarms or circumstances where FDA could withdraw your status and then even if no harm was found, again, the process has not been fully articulated for how you could get your status back, which could subject small growers to excessive regulation without any, without any means of recourse and without any due process. This is a huge issue. It's one of the major points that we'll be arguing for in our comments to FDA, um, is, is that these rules do not need to have a one strike and you're out approach for farmers and for food operations. Last issue page, this is a big one if you're a business person, keeping an eye on your bottom line. The costs of compliance are quite high. And even more of a, in, in addition to that, causing a problem, the pieces of the rules that deal with training and technical assistance are currently unfunded. So one, there's going to be pretty substantial costs on the backs of farms and facilities. And two, FDA doesn't have the financial resources to do the kind of training in TA that folks across the food system are going to need. I've got some numbers up on the screen so you can get a ballpark idea of where these costs could fall. Those produce rule numbers fall, um, those are for someone who may be fully subject to the rule. So if you're a small farm, that could be almost 13,000 bucks a year. For preventive controls, again that's you food hub folks, if you're subject to the full HARP-C requirements, FDA estimates it could cost about $13,000 a year to fully comply. Uh, I don't know about how comfortable your bottom lines are, but that is definitely not a small figure, and we're very concerned that those cost figures could, one, put operations out of business, or two, stunt their growth and development, or three, impede new operators from getting started in the field, which is so critically needed because of the cost of compliance. So I know I've been talking at you for a long time, and I'd like to just kind of circle back to a couple take-homes, and then we'll answer questions. So let me, you know, if you're going to take anything away from the nuts and bolts for food hubs, here you are. First, the pieces of the produce rule that we talked about, those may impact your growers. We want to make sure they understand what's going on and they are able to weigh in with FDA. Two, you almost certainly, if you're a food hub, will be considered a facility under the preventive controls rule, and you may be subject to part or all of the regulations, depending on the scale of your operation. If you're a farm and you do any kind of anything to anyone else's product on your farm, you or if you do any kind of light processing to your own, op, your own food, you too may be subject, considered a facility and subject to all or part of the preventive controls rule. You absolutely should familiarize yourself with that propose regulations for facilities, including what exactly HARP-C would require of you, so you can get a better handle on how it compares with your existing food safety practices and what it would take for you to come into compliance. Finally, all of this means we definitely really, really, really need all of you to be prepared to weigh in with FDA on these draft rules asking for the kinds of improvements we need to make sure they work for you. Let me give you a couple hypothetical examples just to kind of bring it home in a more concrete way, and then we'll take questions. Here we go, just a couple. Um, and again, I know it's kind of confusing, so hopefully this helps a little bit. So, for example, again, if you're a food hub, you'll almost certainly be required to register as a facility with FDA and be subject to inspection. 
In addition, if your business is based on a farm, qualifies as a small or very small business, and you are only doing the kind of packing and holding that FDA considers low risk, you may be eligible for exemption from harp -C. The list of low risk processing activities and what small and very small business means are all up on our website, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. If, let's say, okay, so that's if you're on a farm. If you're a food hub and you're not based on a farm, if you meet that Tester Hagen threshold, because you're either a very small business, or you meet, and again, remember, they haven't decided what that threshold's going to be yet, or you meet that two-part Tester Hagen eligibility test based on gross sales and percent of direct sales, you might be eligible for those less intensive modified requirements. That said, one last example, if you're not based on a farm and or you're not eligible for those modified requirements under Tester Hagen, you're likely to be subject to the full harp requirement of the preventive controls rule as a part of doing business. So really the key issues at stake here are that food hubs, like other businesses, absolutely have a responsibility for food safety, but we have got to ensure that these rules are risk and scale appropriate and that they don't put, put operations out of business through misguided or excessive regulation. We really need to ensure that the kinds of measures the preventive controls rule may require of you are reasonable and achievable and both likely to improve food safety and not put you out of business. We're very concerned that the level of paperwork and expense required of that, especially that full harp C compliance, could really chew up a food hub's bottom line, hence the importance of you weighing in and of us taking action on issues like that very small business threshold. And with that, it's time to take some questions. Okay, um, so Jesse asks, um, does a food hub qualify as a consumer or retail food establishment? In other words, could our hub provide Tester Hagen exemption for our smaller providers? Unfortunately, no, unless the food hub itself was selling all of its product directly to a consumer. So like a multi-farm CSA setup? Right. Yeah, so if you're, so unf yeah, unfortunately, otherwise, no. I'm, I'm pretty sure the answer to that is no. No, no, pass through. Okay. Um, will, uh, Dave asks, would produce sold from a farm to a retail establishment via grower-owned cooperative qualify under Tester Higgin? So similar. Um, That's a good question. I'd probably need to know a little bit more about the structure of that operation and how specifically the produce moves through, but that would be a good one. We could definitely talk offline and, and work through your situation in specific. Okay, uh, and uh, Dave should email FISMA at sustainableagriculture.net? Great. Yeah, please Great. do, so we could know a little bit more about, about your situation, because that's the kind of thing that may fall into a regulatory gray area. So you would be a great candidate for weighing in with FDA because that's an example of the kind of operation they didn't really think about with the rules and we want to make sure you don't get mistakenly placed into high level of regulation. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, Julie asks, if my co-op requires that each farm pack their own products, would that give the hub the, an exemption? So there's no packing. There is aggregating done at the hub. You're um, still, um, if you We'd, uh, you would likely still be considered a facility because you would be holding um, multiple farms products. So if you're holding them on a facility, um, depending on, there may be a couple of factors there, but most likely you would be considered a facility. Okay. And I would, I would double check that. Um, just a note, we have a, a whole issue page on our website called Do I Operate a Facility? I'd walk yourself through that um, just to be sure, but likely you would be a facility. Good. Okay. Um, that's also at sustainableagriculture.net slash FSMA. Yep. Great. Um, uh, Laura asks, uh, do producers that sell through food hubs count as selling directly to consumers? Now, I, I happen to... So, so there, are, there are several food hubs that... Um, um, provide the uh, uh, web-based uh, 
ordering uh, system, uh, do the logistics, but um, individual consumers buy directly from individual farms. So mm -hmm. that, um, is, is that an, an exempt case, even if uh, other of the Food Hub's activities involve selling wholesale? not these particular that's a, that's a great question um, and one of the tricky bits with regards to those modified requirements is that the threshold for sales applies to, to all food not just covered products uh. and I would say in that case that's the kind of operation that might be eligible for a level of modified requirements under preventive controls but would would likely be considered a facility but that again is a this is why we're so concerned about the issue for food hubs is so many of these operations fall into a gray area. Mm -hmm. So you would again be a good candidate to explain your operation and note to FDA that it's not clear where you fall. Um, because if, yeah, so if the farm is, you know, if the, the food is going directly to a consumer but through an online marketplace, hmm, yeah. So I wouldn't but, assume, yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say, Sarah, I think, I think your point here uh, is uh, the, where you said um, make, make your comment, make your situation clear and say and, you know, uh, ex explain uh, that this is a, a scenario that FDA must consider when they make their final regulations. Um, e even if we don't know exactly where it stands right now, we, we're, mm -hmm. we're hoping to direct where it stands in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And I think making the case that, you know, you shouldn't, that that sort of operation should not be considered a facility and should not be subject to the preventive controls rule is a really good case to make, to say to FDA, look, this is a direct-to-consumer channel. And as such, yeah, that's that's a really great, you're a great candidate to make a comment to FDA along those lines. Mm -hmm. Julie because asked, that's an unclear okay. point. Yeah, okay, absolutely. Julie asks, are restaurants considered to be end consumers? And I'm assuming the answer is no there. You know, actually, that's a good question, and I think they actually may be. Oh, really? Um, there's sort of this, there's this, there's this, let me, uh, let me double check that and try to get back to you either on this call or over email, because I, I need to double check that, but they actually may be considered an end user. Huh, okay. Um, Thomas asks a critical question, and I'm sure many people here <laughs> want to know the answer. By commenting, do we expose ourselves to inspection? That is a really excellent question. Um, at this point in the game, the answer, I hope the answer is no. I guess I'll, I'll answer it this way. We cannot know for sure, but at this point, the answer is so the folks here in D.C. who are the people who are going to read those comments are people based here in Washington, D.C., who are explicitly tasked with writing and editing and drafting these rules. They are not the field staff. They are not the people who are going to be out in the field doing the inspections once the rules become law. I think the chance of that is, is, is slim to none. And yeah, I'd say it's slim to none because there, there's this is this is dealing with the folks who are writing the rules, not the folks who are out in the field inspecting. Okay, good. Um, and you know, uh, as as long as you are honest and straightforward, one one hopes the U.S. government would take care of you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, Harley uh, gives a comment that says uh, restaurants are not end users as they prepare foods for others. An end user is, uh, is the end eater. Uh, so uh, well, in that case, no. served at home in a, in a private setting. Yeah, there are some cases in which, um, so they, it's a little bit tricky. Um, so <laughs> I, I, say, I say it's tricky because um, when we, when I, so we, we, say, we use consumer as shorthand for uh, when we talk about uh, the modified requirements under the produce rule. But t I just looked it up, and technically, according to FDA, um, a qualified end user is, it's really less about the consumer piece and more about, are you, it's about the relationship. Are you selling directly to 
the, the person, the end user. So is the farmer making the direct sale as opposed to a broker or a wholesaler? So it's consumers, restaurants, or retail food establishments like grocery stores. Those are uh -huh. all considered qualified end users and would, uh -huh. would count with regards to um, the Tester Hagen requirements. But but maybe only if it's without an, a food hub intermediary. Right. Yeah. So really, it's about that direct farmer yeah. to buyer as opposed Got it. to like who is the buyer. Got farmer it. to. Yeah. So thanks for that question. That's a really good question, um, and I'm glad someone asked that. Uh, Thomas is asking, uh, what is the proposed timeline for compliance? That's a great question. Lots of good questions. Um, yeah. So right now, the rules are not yet final law. Uh, we don't anticipate. So at this point in time, uh, there's a court order standing that FDA is supposed to finalize them sometime in 2015. I cannot recall the exact date. Uh, if that were to, there's no guarantee even that'll happen. Um, at, from this point on, the comment period will close in November. The FDA will take some time to go and read all the comments that have been submitted. They may then choose to publish the final rule. They may also then choose to publish a second draft. That's what we're calling for publicly and hoping is happening so we can have a chance, another chance to improve the rules, a chance to see where they made changes or not. Once that, if they go into another proposed rule, you can imagine there's another comment period, another review timeline, it'll be a while. Um, if they go right to final rule, it, the rules will become sort of law effectively, but there's, it's not, you, know, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't expect to see inspectors out in the field the next day working on these new rules. So long story short, we don't know. Right now, technically, 2015 is when they're supposed to be final. Um, but that is, I would say, a moving target at best. <laughs> I would, in the next few years. But you should have relatively, you should have some notice when that were to come. Okay, right, um, and and we will we will help get out that notice. Um, <laughs> Excellent. In the Tester Hagen um, uh, amendment, the gross sales are averaged over three years. The other pr provision yeah. with the direct sales is that fifty one percent averaged over a period of time, or that year, or t how that's does a very good question. Let me. I'm you know, um, just taking a look right now to see. Um, you know, I don't know if they specify. <laughs> Interestingly enough, I'm not even sure. You know, I'd have to go back and check. Um, I'd have to go and specifically check that out. Okay. It's a very good question. Okay. Um, and yeah, I'll have to check. We will be posting the slides and the recording of this webinar on our site, and um, all of these homework assignments that we're giving Sarah, we will, we will post the answers to those uh, on that uh, same same web page. Yeah, y'all uh, are asking good questions. I'm not even sure that that's actually in the rules. <laughs> I think it may. <laughs> that's great. You all should be uh, working on policy. <laughs> great. No, this is this is exactly what this is. This is fantastic. Yeah, we'll find out. Jeff is uh, asking um, for farms that uh, pack storage crops that are stored stored at the farm level for future sales for a half, you know up to half a year. Is that farm subject to the facility rule? If you are simply storing your own farm your own products on your own farm, you are not subject to the preventive controls rule. That would fall under um, storing of your own storage crops on your, your own farm would fall under FDA's cons uh, definition of what's considered on-farm activities. OK. Um, Julie writes, uh, in a far in farmer direct in a farmer direct marketing co-op where the restaurant buys directly from the farm, and their co-op provides the delivery service to those farm members. It, it appears uh, reasonable um, that those sales and delivery would qualify as direct farm direct sales. Right. So uh, you, you have the the co-op providing the delivery service for mm -hmm. a farm to restaurant direct connection. Um. So. For the farm, for when the if that so if that farmer was looking at 
that's if the and so I guess it depends. That may come. That may be. That's a really interesting question. Um, and I again like the earlier question. That one is one where FDA really didn't consider the diversity of different ways that different kinds of businesses and cooperatives provide services to growers. If I think if legally the grower retains ownership of the product and is simply contracting or paying or partnered in in some fashion for the delivery service, mm -hmm. one, one could most likely make the argument that then, oh man, yeah, you know what? That's, we, I think we're gonna need to take a little closer look for, I know there's a couple co-ops on the phone. We will take a look at that because there's a couple questions along these lines and that is a that is a major gray area, and I think it may hinge on sort of who how ownership is transferred along that product line. But we need to look into that because I know there's some grower cloths on the phone. So let me take a look, and we'll try to get some info before we send out these this recording. Okay, great. Um, so I know we have a couple. We have a couple of lawyers um, who have been doing some heavy duty research on some of these issues, good. and they may be able to give us a legal opinion on how to interpret that piece of it. Okay. Good. There, there are several more questions, Sarah. Uh, do you want to um, talk about the commenting and then we'll uh, come back to some more questions? Or do you want to take a couple more now? Um, yeah, why don't we talk a few minutes about commenting and then we'll take the rest of the questions at the end. This All is right. the fast part. This won't take too long. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Great. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Um, thank you, guys. Those are really fantastic questions. And like I said, anything that we can't answer today, we'll take a look. And the only reason we won't answer is because we want to make sure we're giving you accurate information to the best of our knowledge. So let me talk for a minute about, all right, you've heard the basics about what these rules look like, what they may or may not cover, how you may or may not be impacted. The task before us now is to weigh in with FDA before their final law while we still have a chance to influence and improve the rules to ensure that they work for you. So just a couple of notes on that end. Your comments absolutely will have an impact. FDA is legally bound to seek public input on these draft rules. They actually legitimately do need and want to hear from you. They're not farmers. They're folks based here in DC. They do not know, and they, and they know they don't know, all the different ways that folks are operating innovatively in the food system. It's really critical that they know so they do not unintentionally crush certain business practices. Everyone's a stakeholder. You do not need to be an expert. Um, something that we tell everybody is if the rules are unclear about a certain issue, it's important that they know that and that you can, so that we have an opportunity to say, this is a thing that happens. This is an important business practice. It should not fall under you know, the full weight of the rules. This is also the, really the number one best way for us to comment. Because their rules are in FDA's hands right now, this comment period is really our last best chance to weigh in and improve them in the next few months before they become final law sometime in the next couple of years. And just one last note on a process front. A lot of times when you see maybe taking action with Congress or, or getting involved in advocacy, you'll see things like petitions or sign-on letters. Those can be helpful in this case, but by, by far, the absolute best number one thing that you can do is to submit your own individual comments on behalf of yourself or your organization or your business. Um, FDA is very explicit about the fact that, you know, they, well, if, if, we see, if they see a petition of 1,000 signatures, they count that as one comment. If they see 1,000 unique comments from 1,000 farmers and business operators, that's a thousand comments that weighs more heavily in their calculus and in the considerations they make on whether or not to make changes to the rules. So let me just emphasize, if at all possible, you know, signing on is fine too, doesn't hurt at all, but if you can and will, submitting your own comments is by far the most important thing that you can do. So how can I comment? How do I do this? You can do it two ways. You can comment online or by mail. You're gonna find instructions that the link you see on your screen the bit.ly link, hopefully you can read that ugly yellow font. Um, there you will find step-by-step -step instructions for how to, how to comment online or by mail. Again, online comments need to be received by November 15th. Mailed-in comments need to be postmarked 
by November 15th. What should I say? Um, well, lots of things. <laughs> when you comment to FDA, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, we've developed some comment templates that growers and businesses and consumers can consider using. You certainly don't have to, but if you'd like some help in structuring your comment, we've created some templates for you. But here's the key again. It can't be a carbon copy of someone else's. It needs to come in your own voice and have your story. So critically, telling your story, explaining what you do, how it works, what your, you know, what your operation looks like. Again, FDA does not always know the different kinds of operations that are out there. They can't make provisions for you to ensure that you're not over-regulated if they do not know you exist. Use data when you have it. Folks out there who have a background in research who can back up their arguments with strong data, strong peer-reviewed scientific evidence, that is fantastic. And including a clear ask. FDA is just like you and I. If someone says, oh, man, I'm really grumpy, I'm not happy about a situation, um, I can't do much about that. If someone says, I'm really unhappy, and I would like you to fix it in this way, I say, OK, I can do something about that. Similarly, and we've included some sample asks in our template. You may have your own. You may find them from other organizations. Um, you know, small farms teams around the country are developing comments. There's lots of places to get guidance. It's very important to include the ask. And again, like I said earlier, asking questions is absolutely fine. If you're unclear, FDA needs to know that. And here's the most important part. Again, comment deadline is November 15th, 2013. That is coming up really soon. So I'll be honest with you, it is not a five-minute process to submit a comment. Uh, it takes a little time. You definitely want to start getting up to speed and thinking a little bit about it now. Here's three things you can do. Really straightforward, and I'll break down some resources we've got at hand to help folks. You want to get informed. You want to take action by submitting a comment. And you want to spread the word, again, to other growers you know, to other businesses, to other people in the community who may care about these issues. Everyone who eats can and should comment on the rules. So some resources that we have at hand, I'll walk you through. I've promised them a couple of times. Um, so I'll go through the general ones, and then I also pulled out a couple of key ones of interest to food hubs that I'll talk about on the next slide. First up top, you're going to see those two links again. The first one, the bit.ly link, is a link to our commenting page. This is the page where you'll find, again, sample comment templates, step-by-step -step instructions for how to comment, um, both for farmers and for consumers. The next page under that is our issue, our action page. This page is where you're going to find the nuts and bolts, the meat of our analysis, and our issue page information, sustainableagriculture.net slash FISMA. And where you, what you're going to find on and those two pages are interlinked to one another. So just so you know, they're linked to one another. Um, this is where you can get informed. You can get every issue that I talked about today, we've got a detailed issue page. We've got links back to the rules themselves and additional resources to help you dig deeper into the issue. Got those sample comments. Got those comment templates, step-by-step -step instructions. We do have a sign-on petition. Let's say you're a CSA operator or you know someone who wants to have some easy thing you can encourage your customers to do in addition to commenting. By all means. They can submit, they can sign the petition. We are submitting that to FDA as a comment. And helping spread the word, making sure that people you know hear about this on, on social media and via newsletters and online. So just a couple of resources to highlight for food hubs in particular, because again, as I've said about 50 times, you guys are a piece of the food system that FDA really overlooked. And we really, really want to make sure that these regs do not put you out of business and do not impede this really critical growing piece of our food system. A couple of things here, and I know these links are a little hard to see, so if you can't get to this link here, the slides will be sent out later. And again, uh-oh, oh, there we go. They're all, um, they're all available from, again, sustainableagriculture.net slash FISMA. So you're going to find there a specific page, uh, who is affected page. There's a sidebar specifically for food hubs that walks you through it in a little more detail. There are some specifics on what HARP-C would require. So if you're wondering, well, how does my existing food safety planning compare, that will walk you through the details of what that would require. And then guidance, as you know, we've talked about these modified requirements where it gets really confusing who is and is not eligible. There's a whole page that helps to walk you through 
in as best detail as we can manage how that might look for you under the preventive controls rule. So just a few visuals for the visual folks among you. Certainly I am one of them. This is sustainableagriculture.net slash FISMA. You'll see that sidebar on the left with all of that in-depth info that you can get into. That big image right on the front, the fixed FISMA image, that's the link to the comment page. Right front and center. Here's the comment page so you know what it looks like. It sends you right away. Um, the farmer template is a little longer, a little more in-depth. The consumer template is simpler and tended to take a little less time. If you're a consumer and you're motivated to do more, by all means, use the farmer template. We wanted to make sure we didn't overwhelm people with too much information. So let's say, okay, you know what? I'm a food hub, I'm a business, I'm a farm. I am really fired up about this issue. I'm going to make a comment to FDA about the rules. I just want to take a second and walk you through what that process might look like. Here you go. This is a screen cap of kind of, of a section of what that comment template looks like. So you'd go to that comment page, you'd scroll down to the farmer section, and you would download this Word file. It's a simple Microsoft Word file. Um, and within that document, you've got 10 numbered issues where we break down in plain language what the issue with the rule is, what our recommendation to FDA is, and right there in the middle, highlighted in yellow, some guiding questions to help you craft a comment to FDA on that issue. So here again comes, I, I picked out the very small business definition to show you because that is one that's really critical for food hubs. Again, we're asking for the million dollar threshold to ensure that startup operations and small businesses can get to scale before they're subject to full scale regulation. So you can see those kinds of guiding questions. These are the questions that help FDA that help give the kind of information that FDA needs to justify making that making that determination. So the questions are example, you know, for example, if you operate a food hub, you know, which 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 option would you fall under, if any? If FDA calculated this definition, you know, how would that impact you? That's the kind of thing where we really need your help weighing in. And I'll note here as well, we've included all 10 in the document. If there are issues you do not feel comfortable or able to weigh in with FDA on, obviously it's a plug and play, it's a cut and paste um, comment on as many or as few as you like. As many as you can is great, but certainly some operations may not feel that they can or should comment on certain issues. Totally okay. All right, so oh, we have um, the black screen again. So while we wait for the, the light of day to return to our screen, we'll hang on for a second here. Can, oh, can I can I sneak in a, another question? Oh, oh, here Jump it is. In. Oh, there we go. Okay, oh, we're one too far again. Can we back it up one more? Yeah. There we go. Okay, great. So here you go. You've taken some time to get informed and read up on the issues. You've drafted your comment in that Microsoft Word file, and it includes you know, some information about your, your business and, and why you feel that there's an issue with the rules. Now you're going to save that file, and you're going to go back to that comment page and click on the comment link. Here's an important thing to know. Uh, there are two rules, as I talked about, produce rule, preventive controls rule. They have, lucky for us, or bureaucratic in a bureaucratically complex fashion, there are two separate comment boxes for each rule, two whole separate web pages. So that means if you are commenting on issues in both of the rules, you'll need to submit your comments twice to two different locations. If you are just commenting on issues in one rule or the other, you only need to submit it once. Our template clearly labels which issues are produce rule, which issues are preventive controls rule, and which issues are both, so you can use that as your guide. It is not a problem at all if, for example, in your comments on preventive controls, there are also produce rule, like, it's okay, repetition or duplication is okay. But just a note, make sure, if, unfortunately it's not our choice, but it, it makes things a little difficult, but that is how FDA set it up. Either way, you're gonna save that Word document, made some comments, you're gonna log on to one or both of these comment pages, and this is what you'll see, it's really simple. 
in this case, we recommend that people say in that little comment box, see attached file, and just go ahead and upload that whole file. Um, there's a really small word limit in the box. You don't want to subject yourself to it. Just go ahead and upload your whole file. You could even cut and paste your comment in if you like as well. And then if you were to scroll down, you would see you know, a spot for your name and your business name and all those things. Really simple. There are step-by-step -step instructions for each field on that, on that form. Hit submit, and you're done. You're going to get, when you submit, a little tracking code that confirms your submission. It's a good idea to save that. Uh, FDA will publish these comments on regulations.gov. It's not in real time. They have to review them before they publish them. But it's a really good idea to save that code to ensure that you, um, that you can double check and ensure that your comment was received. And we have a black screen one more time. All right, there we go. Perfect, great. All right, well, we're down to the very end, and I think I'd like to take some questions. So let me just reiterate a few things that I said, and then we shall jump into another question round. Let's see. Having a little delay here. There we go. All right. So again, just to reiterate, when it comes to commenting, by all means, we really need and hope and wish and would love for you to submit a comment. It's absolutely critical. Again, can't say it enough that folks who may be impacted by these rules weigh in while they have a chance before the rules are final law. Help us reach out. Help us make sure that your peers and allies and friends and business partners and consumers know and weigh in on comments as well. And you know, reach out. We have lots of sample materials online. The consumer materials are a little broader. I went into very nitty gritty today because I know this is an audience that, that can handle that and wants that. The consumer materials are broader. You can find some of those again online on our comment page. Anything that you see online on our pages, you can use. Just give us a credit back. If you have a newsletter, if you want to send it on an email, it's all there for you as a tool and a resource to share. And with that, I think we will um, get to this last slide and take more questions. Julie asks, um, can you tell, tell us again uh, where to get the files uh, to insert into the comment section? Um, she's Absolutely. Asked. Yeah, that is, um, so the two files, the consumer and farmer templates, are both available online. If you go to sustainableagriculture.net slash FS, M A. Um, again, if you want to go to the if you want to advance one slide, that link is up too. Um, there's a big image right on the front page that says "Fix Fisma, Take Action Today." When you click there, you'll go to the comment page, and it's simply a matter of scrolling down, and you'll see both templates available for download, both the farmer and consumer option. And if you have any trouble with that. The email address, the FSMA at sustainableagriculture.net, we monitor that daily. If you have any technical difficulties, if you have questions, um, we're here to answer and we're here to help. One of our um, attendees uh, understands that the original intent of the Tester Hagen Amendment was that the small farms would be totally exempt, but you were talking about modified requirements. How, uh, how can one make a comment that um, pushes FDA's implementation more towards the uh, original uh, intention of the Tester Hagen Amendment? That's a great question. And, and this is, again, where we go back to the issue of the, the distinction between what Congress intended and how FDA chose to interpret that congressional intent. And with insects comments and sort of with our approach, we're trying to do as much as we possibly can to ensure that smaller growers, sustainable growers, innovators like food hubs are not subject to excessive regulation. And you can absolutely, when you comment, if you say, you know, in my, I'm a farmer, I, you know, it looks like by my reading of the rules, I am subject to, you know, the modified requirements or, you know, whichever piece. I believe that farms of my scale should be exempt. You can, you can absolutely make that argument um, if that's how you, if, if that is an argument that you feel. You know, if you want to, and I would recommend if that, in that case, you know, 
getting it, you know, we, I'm pretty sure on our website we link to it, if not um, the law, the full FISMA law as passed by Congress is online. You could go in there, take a close read of yourself of the Tester Hagen piece, copy that sucker right into your comment and make sure you <laughs> remind them <laughs> of what that language holds. But yeah, there's always, there's, there's so many issues where there's Congress said one thing and then it was interpreted another way. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I personally have a question, um, which is, um, how, how do you make a comment that, um, that doesn't sound just like, hey, this is new, new regulations that I don't want to have to deal with, uh, so why don't you just lay off? You know, in other words, how can, we, how can the comments be phrased uh, in such a way as to uh, acknowledge the responsibility that we have for food safety and yet um, make them work better for the way our businesses are going to work? That is a fantastic question, um, and you're right. I think there's definitely a concern. You know, what we don't want is for um, for FDA to interpret our comments as a knee jerk. I, you know, stay off of my property. Um, you know, people may feel that way, and they are certainly in their rights to feel that way. But you're right that when it comes to constructively impacting the rules, that may not be necessarily the most effective approach, and so. What we're encouraging folks to do along those lines and what a lot of the questions in our farmer template cover is, again, share some information with FDA about your current practices, um, making sure they understand, you know, making it clear right up front, I'm a producer, I'm a food hub, we're committed to food safety, we are already taking these sorts of measures. Perhaps you're already GAP certified, perhaps you aren't certified in any way, but you take measures. You work with your partners, or maybe you work with your buyers to comply. The you know, most folks who are doing business are, you know, if you're selling to a school, if you're selling through, you know, if you're selling to any large, you know, regional buyer, odds are pretty good that they are making food safety requests of you. Making sure FDA understands that you guys are not, you know, that folks are not out there deliberately trying to contaminate food. That you are already taking steps, articulating what those are, why they're effective, is a really great context to then make constructive feedback on the rules. Roy asks, will there be any effort to quantify the economic impact of these regulations after implementation? And I'd like to add a part B, which is, or maybe it's a part before A, <laughs> which is, have there been any efforts to quantify the end, uh, uh, sort of uh, project the economic impact of the regulations? Great questions. Um, okay, so the, the question to the, the Part B, uh, FDA did do an economic analysis of the potential impact of the rules. And the scary part is they baldly uh, admit in that report that these regs could put people, could put businesses could put farms and facilities out of business and could deter new farmers and food facilities from opening. So their own analysis shows that that could be the case, and that's where we got. Um, I put those cost of compliance figures come from their own economic analysis. Uh, we feel like they also we feel like methodologically it's not the best thing in the world. Uh, if anybody wants a copy of that you can contact us and we can point you to it. So yes, they have done it. We feel it has problems, but it does make some really concerning points as well. And as far as after the rules are implemented, I don't believe that they have any plans at FDA to do so, but you can definitely bet that those of us who are working on these issues will be really carefully watching and trying to track and calculate and measure potentially negative impacts on industries so that we can make a case, if we need to, to further improve or change the rules so that they do not uh, harm sustainable ag. Who will handle enforcement? Um, will it uh, be USDA, uh, State Departments of Ag? Will it be FDA? Right now, it's, it's FDA. So that is FDA inspectors. And will will they have the the manpower and the the money? Absolutely, they do not. They don't. No, and no. It's a concern. It's a concern at the implementation level. Um, 
they they haven't. When you think about um, the number, what is it? Several, I mean, there's two million farmers in the country. I mean, there are millions of farms in the country, most of whom uh, have never, in any fashion, been inspected by FDA. FDA does not have the manpower or the the man or woman power hired right now to commence inspection, and it's sort of an open question. And a, and coming back to that earlier person's question about implementation and about when the rules were going to come into effect. They may technically come into effect, um, but whether or not FDA will have the resources to do inspections across the country uh, is an open question, and it, at this point, they don't. Okay, and Cole mentions uh, that the Kansas Department of Ag uh, told them in an interview that uh, they expect FDA will lean heavily on state agencies to help implement, and will need to provide resources for that. So. Yep, that's very possible. Yeah, no, that's that's a that's actually a sort of a piece that's in that's 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 up for up for sort of comment as well in the rules. And actually, the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture is is heavily involved in the commenting process, and is encouraging. I think many 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 state departments of ag are commenting on the rules and are very closely working with FDA to try to figure out what exactly their role will be. Yeah, no, that's a great point. There, there will be some role, but it is, it's very much in negotiation. Okay. And Cole, sticking with you, um, yes, how do you answer the question of what farm products do these two rules apply to when people ask? For example, uh, his organization wishes to persuade farms of all types to comment, but they yep. have a feel like they need to express how it would impact them, even if their products are exempt or partially exempt. That's a great question. Um, so the first thing is FDA puts a, there's a list of covered produce online. Uh, you can get to them from our website or you can get to them straight in the rules. So first things first, it's good to make sure people do know what, what is the list of, of explicitly covered produce on farms. And then secondarily, a couple of thoughts there. Um, there's the bigger picture concept of whether or not you explicitly are growing product that is covered if you ever might wish to diversify if your neighbors may be growing that sort of thing, if you have business partners, uh, neighbors at the farmer's market, folks who are interconnected with you in any fashion in the food system, you want to speak up for them too. And a second piece, I didn't talk about this issue a whole lot um, on this call, but something else to consider is that, let's say, and this is what we call the all food issue, which is that when we go back to that Tester Hagen rule about that $500,000 sales figure, that sales figure does not apply just to covered produce, that applies to everything you sell on your farm. That means if, let's say, someone is a you know corn and soybean grower in the greater Midwest, and they wish to, they, they want to do a little bit of experimenting and diversify with, you know, a strawberry you pick patch, or, or like a strawberry, you know, a strawberry patch on their farm, and maybe they want to have a little you pick and take some to the farmer's market. Just as a sideline, a little bit of diversification, a business opportunity for the kids, whatever it, it may be. If they're selling more than $500,000 worth of commodity product, that means that even if they only have 5000 bucks in strawberry sales, those strawberries would be subject to the produce rule, the highest level of produce rule regulation. So, so that's an important piece to think about when you're thinking about who may or may not be affected. I'll note as well, even if someone thinks they are exempt now, we don't know how these rules may evolve over the next five to ten years. It is a good idea now. It's in everyone's interest in the whole food system to weigh in now to ensure that they work for as many growers as possible because they could change and they could change over the years and folks who may not be affected now could find themselves affected down the line. So for instance, other other types of food products, not just produce, meat, uh, yep. that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, well and meat is pretty fully you know regulated under US. Um, USDA. However, mm -hmm. if there were, let's say there were a foodborne, uh, let's say, let's for example, um, baking potatoes, you know, they're, again, they're not consumed raw, they're not covered. If we were to have a major foodborne illness outbreak coming, coming from baking potatoes, it is, you know, it is possible that, that that is a product that could be added to coverage under the rule. You know, that's the kind of thing where it's possible down the line five years from now, there were, if there were an outbreak on a different kind of product, that FDA might be able to add that product to coverage under the rules. 
Okay. <clears throat> well, Sarah, I, I want to thank you so much. We uh, we are at time, but I, I do have a few few more words to say. But really, this was incredibly incredibly helpful. Uh, and uh, all, all of our attendees who are still here, you now have a sense of urgency. Um, make your comments. Tell your unique perspective. Please, please do it. Um, and uh, you know, make sure we can all stay in business to uh, support and build our regional food systems. This webinar is recorded. Oh, Go ahead. I was going to say yes, and we will um, we'll get the answers to those two questions that we couldn't answer about the 51% of sales and the grower co-ops piece. We'll try and get the best answer we can figure out for that and make sure it gets out to registrants. Great, and Brandon has a, a specific question too uh, that I will I will send over to you, but we ran out of time. Sorry. Um, so we are uh, we did record this webinar, and we will post it on mgfn.org within a, a few business days. Although oftentimes we we do it by the next day. And this is a special event webinar uh, for our food hubs, but I want to let you know about our MGFN webinar series on the third Thursday of each month at 3:30 p.m. Eastern time. We bring in experts building and supporting regional food systems to share their knowledge and their wisdom. Sign-up links are always at ngfn.org slash webinars, but uh, if you'd like to sign up for either of the next two upcoming webinars, uh, you can do that in the post-webinar survey. November, we're going to look at some top-notch ways that trainers have solved the problem of teaching farmers the necessary business and financial skills to plan and run their operations successfully. Uh, and for the hol holiday season, we're going to look at some innovative food banks and how they've been able to leverage their significant infrastructure and buying power to get local and regional food to all people. Another group that needs to comment on FISMA. <laughs> um, you can let it, let us know if you'd like to be part of those webinars just in our, our post-webinar survey. Um, as Food Hub staff, you'll be interested to know about our upcoming National Food Hub Conference in spring 2014. We'll meet for two and a half days in Raleigh, North Carolina, March 26 to 28. Our theme is Building Capacity for Healthy Regional Food Systems. We'll have multiple tracks to assist food hubs in taking their business to the next level, tons of networking opportunities, some fascinating tours, and even curbside consulting ask the expert sessions where you'll be able to have quick one-on-one -on -one consulting sessions with some of the nation's top minds on food hubs and regional food systems. Registration is not open yet, uh, but visit ngfn.org slash hubs2014 for more information and updates. We'll also be issuing a request for uh, workshop proposals, so look with that look for that within a couple of weeks. Uh, again, ngfn.org slash hubs2014 is the place to look. We'll also be alerting you through email, so make sure you ask uh, to, for us to put you on our mailing list. Foodhub.info is a food hub hub of information. The, uh, there's case studies, a map of the food hubs across the country. If, uh, it's also a, a place uh, to uh, let us know if, there, if you are a food hub and you're not on that list. Please, please let us know. Um, you can find the NGFN on YouTube, on Twitter, and on our website, ngfn.org. The Wallace Center is also on Facebook. Look for the Wallace Center at Winrock International. Uh, and if you haven't already, sign up for our email updates. There is a link on the ngfn.org homepage, or really the easiest way is in the post-webinar survey. Just let us know. Uh, the NGFN Food Hub Collaboration would like to thank you for your time today. And again, uh, fill out that survey and give your comments to FTA. All right. Take care, all. Thank you.